I'm going to tell you a bit about OpenOffice, hopefully from a, a not very... So there are two levels. There's the not very technical level, which I don't find very interesting, and then there's the very technical level. But we have to cover some not very technical things, just so you get some big picture uh, information. So we'll do some of that. And then we'll have some horrendously far too technical stuff that will bore you all in the middle. Anyway, so what is new in OpenOffice? Incidentally, I speak far too fast. I'm sorry about that. Um, I can't do anything about it if I get excited, so you have to, you know, sort of wave at me or something. One of the new things in OpenOffice 2.0 is uh, base. Inside Novell, we started renaming our programs uh, spreadsheet, for example, instead of numeric, right, uh, uh, in the bad old days. And people started saying there's a bug in spreadsheet instead of what it actually was, because they didn't know the name. Either way, some, someone imaginative in the marketing department decided this new name, base the database. So anyway, there's a bug in base. But all of this code was originally there, um, but no one knew it was there, and no one was using it. So it's a real shame to invest such a huge amount of effort, but you can only find it if you go file something, something, submenu, something, something else, and then you're there, you know? So we thought as a sort of marketing, rebranding, and beautification effort, we put it all in one place and call it base. And so here it is. And uh, this, as you can see, is a pretty screenshot of the evolution integration. Uh, it just so happens that this is done as a, a database backend. Uh, Kmail, I think, has a similar thing. Um, and so, you know, you can do queries on your family addresses and so on. And, you know, it'll show you all my personal information, which is great. Some other things that we improved in T0 were uh, ergonomics. If you'd used uh, Impress to do presentations before, it was absolutely appalling. Uh, really, really unusably bad. And uh, it's much less so now. And more, more to the point, we have uh, some very nice transition uh, stuff happening. So you can do all these effects. You'll notice in my talk there are almost no effects at all. Um, but some people, when they get bored writing their presentation, uh, they think that they can add value to their, their talk by adding sort of funny transitions that then take a long time to happen while they're you know, standing here and they can't flip sides quickly. Um, but, you know, this is a bullet point that's important to have for marketing reasons, and now we have it, which is good. And uh, you can select your master page and fiddle around with that. Spreadsheets, uh, we now have uh, 64K rows and some uh, funky new pivot table things. I've been told to demo the pivot table functionality. This talk can become interactive. <laughs> right, who knows what a pivot table is? Uh, I do, so I put my hand up, right? And yeah, that's how it works. Okay, good. Well, so pivot tables are very powerful and almost no one understands them, as you can see uh, from the straw poll. And uh, so I'll just show you a very quick uh, demo of that if I can find it, um, uh, because it's actually useful. Uh huh. Okay, let's have that one. And hopefully it'll load fairly quickly. So I have this highly confidential uh, Novell sales uh, data dump from my database here. And as you can see, we're, we're doing pretty well on the eclectic uh, things. But anyway, you see there's a whole load of data. And it's really unstructured, right? This is a very typical database output. And you can't really see who sold the most slugs, right? Or what happened in EMEA, or, or whatever. Um, so what pivot tables allow you to do, uh, which is really, uh, actually, I should point out at this point, since this man is recording it, that what I'm referring to when I say pivot table is actually not a pivot table, because pivot table is a trademark uh, of Microsoft Corporation, uh, which are very wonderful. What I'm actually showing you is something that could be like a pivot table, um, but it's actually a data pilot. Okay. Just, I thought I would make that clear and acknowledge the trademark. Uh, good, okay, so here you come to data, uh, or tools even, and uh, uh, hopefully you can find it. And where is it, Rene? Tell me. I have this, uh, this cheat sheet here. I think it must be in data. Uh, data pilot, yeah, here we go. And then we go start, uh, and use the constellation. Now what it allows you to do is to view, for example, uh, the operative on this field here. So you can see you know, uh, which of these bold fellows earn much, and, and the region is column, and then maybe the number of units they, they made, right? So you can see very quickly who sold what in what region and how much money they got for it. And of course you see it's the sum here, so it, it sums all of those uh, uh, fields together. But of course you don't have to have a sum, you can have all manner of uh, horrendous uh, different kinds of things, you know, years and standards and standard deviations and percentages of other things and, you know, I mean, it's, it's incredibly powerful. And then, of course, you can filter it as well. So uh, you can say, uh, we've already got a region, let's say, uh, product here. So when we create this guy, uh, we get probably something meaningless at the bottom here. 
And, and you can see then uh, the operative on this side, and you can see the region, and you can see the sum of everything. This side, right, okay, this is really basic spreadsheet stuff, but since none of you understand it, uh, I thought I'd explain it a bit. Uh, so that uh, you, know, you can then see quite how useful this can be to visualize huge unstructured data sets. And of course, it becomes more interesting when you see what the competition does later. But anyway, so this is the number of sales sold in these regions by those guys, the, the total sum and so on. Well, understand? Good. I'll shut up. Then. Well, thank you, thank you. And for my next trick. Good. So a whole load of stuff uh, happens in Writer and across the board to improve the ergonomics and uh, to add a whole load of things. So um, one of the nice things that happens is, is that Microsoft adds a new feature into Office, and often it doesn't become very prevalent because it's not very usable, but then they add a whole load of usability stuff, and people start using it everywhere. Um, and so one of those things is auto shapes, and people start using them more and more and more to create graphs and drawings and diagrams and all these sort of things. So we add another feature, and I, I'm treading on another uh, trademark here. I believe auto shape is a trademark. I should probably label that too. Uh, so we have custom shapes. Okay. And so here are our custom shapes that are interoperable and compatible and blah. Um, so you can draw more smiley faces more quickly, and uh, you can adjust them once you've made them. Let me, uh, well, I can demo that at the end when I've run out of things to say. Um, floating dockable toolbars that pop up and you can move around. Format copy brush so you can copy styles from places and uh, enrich your document more easily in a stylistic way. So instead of going bold, you copy a style from, no, I don't know, something like that. Nested tables, uh, obviously. Uh, since the web was invented, people like to do almost every layout thing with deeply nested tables. And so it's nice if you can nest tables. And so, you know, this helps their interoperability a lot and people that like tables. And uh, lots better desktop integration, lots of GNOME, KDE, GNOME VFS, KDE PIM, evolution, file selectors, and so on and so on. And here's a photograph of it. And, ah, I say, that's the next slide that's the photograph of this. Clip art, if you, if you have a penchant for drawing strange things, then you can, uh, you know, add them to the clip art collection and we'll render them to bitmaps and uh, shove them in OpenOffice. And this is the, uh, this is the latest, beautiful, most sexy search in the file selector thing, showing you know, your nice GNOME integration file selector and search for something and there you can open it, which is good. So some other new stuff in OpenOffice 2.0 is uh, XForms support. I never knew what XForms was until I uh, started using OpenOffice and saw it was a bullet point. Um, XForms apparently is the next generation of revolutionary web content, right? It's good, isn't it? Yeah. How many new X generations there are of revolutionary web content, I don't know. I mean, there are lots of them. Um, whether it ever comes to anything, I hope it does, I guess, but uh, you can never tell. And, um, but either way, this is pretty gooey, and you can draw the things nicely, and it all does what it's supposed to, and it's standards compliant, and all that good, good stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, having filled your form out, you can write a little plugin that then prints all of this data out. Uh, you know, the US spends $15 billion a year, mainly on student labor, I assume, so maybe some of you, you know, have a, a real feeling for this, typing that stuff back in again, you know? So you type it all in, print it out, post it, and someone else types it back in again, and then it's in your database, which is good. Um, so the thought is that instead, you can uh, write a little plugin that will print out a 2D barcode, which you then sign, and uh, it turns out that was an indemnity clause, a mortgage on your house, and you've just sold everything to someone else, or something, um, which is good. Uh, document signing. Okay, so also there's this wonderful world of cryptography, which uh, is really difficult to use. If anyone has uh, ever tried to get a, a secure key that's cryptographically authenticated with other... Uh, Debian have these amazing things. Uh, it reminds me, you know, where you will sign keys and look at passports and all this wonderful infrastructure around signing that makes it almost impossible to use in a, in, you know, in a real world situation, it, it, unusable. But it's all there, you know, if you've done all that stuff, it, it can work nicely. Unfortunately, I didn't, so I can't demo, demo it. I'm not in on it. Um, the OASIS file format, I'll talk a little bit about that later. It's a new standard. There are so many standards to choose from, it's brilliant, but it's a new standard. We have nicer PDF export, better interoperable across the board, there's a photograph uh, here. Uh, the, the tiresome thing about interoperability is you can improve it a whole lot, but there's not really much to show, you know? You can say it didn't work in the past and now it does, but hopefully no one noticed, so. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about OpenOffice itself um, as a project uh, and why it's important. Um, so there's a real price gradient here, okay? So uh, normal people use it today. If, you, if you're hacking on OpenOffice on the train, as you do with your laptop running Linux or BSD or, or what, something free, um, you know, people will go be showing you, oh, that's OpenOffice. You're like, who are you? You, know. <laughs> you go to a party with normal people in the evening, you know, and you wander around sort of grunting at yourself. And, 
And it turns, turns out that loads of people are using OpenOffice randomly in their, in their offices. And this is brilliant. Of course, there's no way to measure it. But uh, the people who are paid to wander around doing this sort of thing, you know, they make up big numbers of millions, you know, eight million, or that's the number of lines of code. Hopefully, we'll get a user for each line of code, and then we can turn them to programmers, and they can maintain that line. Yeah. Anyway. But the nice thing is that uh, if you look at the, the price of uh, a desktop machine with Office on it, the pie chart breaks down a little bit like this. Okay, so I rang Microsoft up to try and get some numbers out of them. And they were not very helpful. They didn't believe I was an OEM. They wanted this partner agreement. They wouldn't give me any numbers. So I, I tried eBay and Google. And this is the sort of thing I come up with. Most of the cost of the PC that you buy is Office. Uh, it's $12 billion for Microsoft in revenue 2005 from The Economist, 30% of their revenue. Um, this is a really big product. And we do a huge amount of what Office does or the, the things that people use from Office right now for free. Now. There are lots of other sexy, you know, projects out there that you can go and work on. There's Beagle, there's, you know, Firefox and this sort of thing. But if you look at some, you know, the desktop stuff, but if you look at the real value in this pie, none of these things really show up. Like, Windows is quite cheap, actually. Uh, Internet Explorer comes free as part of that pie chart. You know, so Firefox is cool, and it's a great piece of free software. But in terms of the real wedge driving free software onto people's computers, OpenOffice is where it is. And, you and I know that this is not the world's most polished, beautiful piece of free software, right? So if we want people to have a good, positive image of where OpenOffice is, I need some help. You knew that already. Right. So where is freedom best served? You know, if you write 100 lines of code today, you know, if you write it in uh, Tech or something, you know, cool, you'll get a beautiful result. I'm sure you'll improve something there. But it will be seen by a best, a fraction of the world's mathematical typesetting community who will love it, right? But if you fix the equation editor in OpenOffice, all of these poor students laboring all over the world uh, will you know, really appreciate what you did. Um, and there's a lot of easy fixes to do. Just as an example of you know, raw money, I know money doesn't motivate everyone, but uh, Novell saved a million dollars in Microsoft Office licensing fees last year. We plan to save it this year and the next year and so on and so on. So it's, it's quite substantial. 80, everyone has it on their uh, machine. 80% of them use it, quotes, as their main office suite, or at least Someone persuaded them to say that in the survey. Um, so this, this next slide is really the, the sort of war that's hotting up between ECMA and OASIS. Or not actually between the standards groups, because mostly the standards people don't mind. They're just about the technical solution. But between other people that sort of hang around the edges and create wars, you know? Wonderful. Um, so in case you didn't know, Microsoft are standardizing their file format and switching to this new XML file format and, and going for this uh, published XML uh, standard that anyone can participate in. If you want to club together, form a nonprofit and join ECMA, you can do it. You can sit there. And the amusing thing is, if you sit on a technical committee, one, commit one, one member, one vote. So Microsoft has the same votes as Novell in the specification. Fascinating, isn't it? Anyway, so th there's a whole lot of work going into making it, but, you know, and you can argue about whether it's beautiful or not. So this is more like the Microsoft uh, non-mixed content layout, you know, and this is more like the open document, uh, how it does it. Of course, very small, so it fits on the slide, right? But you get the idea, you know, that the content is either <clears throat> you split up your whole document and make little spans that have various attributes, or you build that into the actual uh, flow of the document. But the, the interesting thing about the two is really that um, one is aiming at 100% backwards compatibility with Microsoft Documents. That's the ECMA format, and that is their overriding goal. You know, so they, they wheel out big banks who say, yeah, actually, we quite like our spreadsheet to calculate the same value. And what they say, actually, behind the scenes, you know, the whole bank is run on spreadsheets, and it's not very stable, really, and, uh, you know, actually, if anything changes, we'd never know, and uh, the whole... I didn't say any of that. Um, <clears throat> but if you go to, uh, interestingly, go to spreadsheet risk analysis conferences, banks' entire capital adequacy ratios, which means how much cash they've got to have sitting around, has been changed due to spreadsheet errors. You know, like this cell was wrong. Uh, oh dear, we need another however many million dollars in cash. So this is, this is kind of not cool if you come along and say, oh, well, we've got a new file format. Unfortunately, uh, none of your data comes into it. And uh, you know, the, all, all the values are different. And some of these things are being addressed in open documents and, you know, whatever. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But, you know, customers don't want their documents to break. So that's my, uh, that's my take on it. And it's a controversial one not shared by virtually anyone else I talk to. So you can uh, flame me afterwards. Uh -huh. Sun is handling open office store office. So another thing that people ask is, what is Sun doing in terms of open office? What, you know, how is Sun related to this? 
Aren't they screwing it up? Aren't they the big evil people? You know, it's interesting. People are always looking for the evil person. You know, they, they like to, to see the world like that. Actually, Sun is doing a really good job um, of, of one thing, which is licensing and, and getting this, you know, done in the open. And they release all of their changes for Star Office out there. They commit it uh, into the public source tree. Um, and that's the authoritative base. Yeah, they add a few modules. They have proprietary bits that they put on as well. But what you see there is essentially what is in Sun's product, as I understand it. And they now offer support for OpenOffice, which is great. Uh, there's some legal bits. There's a joint copyright assignment. So you own the copyright on your work, but Sun does too. It's sort of like fork, copy on, right. Oh, I don't know. It's, it copies your copyright, right? Um, and the source is under the LGPL and, uh, not the G, G, and the GPL, obviously. And uh, we've got rid of the sizzle because it was widely abused. You know, having this recorded is a shame in some ways. Never mind. Um, it was widely abused by some people. I would suggest you go and Google for Fork, Open Office, and see who's been doing it. This is a very large company that's rather unpleasant about it. Anyway, another interesting IP issue is that Sun has got a patent covenant. Now, patent covenants are really revolutionary. I've never heard of them before, and they're cool. They're really cool. Um, so if you enter RMS's talk earlier, you'll hear what it's possible to say about patents if you don't have any money. Um, and you're not affiliated with any large company and so on. And I recommend his, you know, his wise words at the beginning of the talk um, to you. You know, it, it's all good stuff. But what Sun's Patent Covenant essentially says is, thankfully, it says, this is the layman's view. I'm a layman. Um, uh, it, it says, we haven't done any patent research. We don't know if there are any patents that either we hold or anyone else holds. Right, that's a good first start, yeah? That clears your ass. But if we happen to have any patents, which we don't know if we do, covering OpenOffice, we promise that we won't sue you if you use OpenOffice and you develop on it and you reuse it under the terms of license. That's an incredibly powerful tool because it's very cheap to do. Uh, it's easy to write. It's non-controversial. And, uh, you know, it's, it's brilliant. And Microsoft has started to do this again for their standards. And this, hopefully, is a brilliant tool in this IP whole cloud. And I, and I hope that it will become more, more prevalent as a as a way to drive your standards, you know, and get it adopted. Um, okay, so the approximate developer breakdown. As you can see, most of the people are, are at Sun, uh, full, full time paid developers. I kind of compensate and create a community segment there. Yeah. Um, so there are, you know, there are other people working on OpenOffice. Clearly, we want to get more people working on OpenOffice so that, uh, you know, there's more influence and we can get some of these things fixed uh, more quickly and, you know, it's a more driven project. There's a scheduling revolution. Occasionally, I've been very downbeat about this, but it's really positive. We've got the scheduling right. Uh, there was something like a 20-month gap between OpenOffice 2.0, uh, 1.1 and 2.0. 20 months, nearly two years. Um, and when we shipped, it was pretty buggy as well. So I mean, it's not like we were making it perfect either. You know. Um, so this is not really very good product development to develop a feature and go away for 18 months and then start bug fixing it when you've entirely forgotten that it existed. So there's, there's major problems here. So what we're doing instead is we're doing three monthly releases and integrating features that are stable and tested and so on and so on, um, and, and just getting features to people more quickly. And that's exciting. So I'm, I'm pleased about that. So you see a lot more of the innovation that's going on. It doesn't look like it's just the same as it always was. Nothing's getting better. And we have a community, in inverted commas, um, that has been cleared expensively from uh, mostly people that talk a lot you know, they're very articulate, right? Brilliant, you know? Um, but they don't actually do very much. In fact, they often exist to stop other people doing things or, or find someone who seems to know what they're doing and then copy what they say, you know, in a sort of demagogic way. Brilliant. Um, and there's a lot of voting, you know? So if, if you're on a mailing list, uh, I'm sure none of you are guilty of this, so I can happily say it. But, you know, there is this huge mail thread about something totally irrelevant and uninteresting. And someone replies to this huge mail in quoting the entire thing. And at the bottom, they go, plus one. And that's it. Then they, occasionally, they put their name as well. And then they post this back to the list as if, and of course, not, I wouldn't mind if this was some really authoritative person that was doing all the work and really, you know, but I never heard of any of them. I didn't see their check-ins, you know. Either way, so th that's the kind of quotes community we have in Open Office. And, and there are some ways that we're trying to fix this and, you know, uh, get the signal up and the noise down and, you know, the work actually happening and so on. But uh, it's kind of discouraging sometimes. So there's also a slightly high barrier to entry, right? You need some real hardcore man's hardware, right? Uh, you know, it's got kind of lower since uh, processors got faster since I wrote the slide. But, you know, it does take six or eight hours to build, which is fine if you're sure it's going to complete, right? I mean, you can go to bed, yeah? Or do what John was saying, head out and talk to your friends and, and all that sort of thing. Um, 
But it's not necessarily guaranteed that it will complete either. It often crashes quite early on. And so we have a, a build system that tries to help this and make it build on common distributions out of the box. Uh, and we put quite a lot of work into that. And you know, if you, if you start on OpenOffice, there are a number of things that Sun tends not to do. Um, you know, fixing simple user interface things, improving the ergonomics, uh, you know, well, all sorts of things like that. Let me talk about what we've been doing recently. How am I doing for time? Ah, uh, you see, that's an asynchronous, unexpected question. 35 minutes. 35 minutes ago. So, um, <clears throat> mono. You see, you didn't get to John Trowbridge's mono slides. I hope you were on John's talk. It was very good. Um, but we can do now beautiful mono integration to some level, so you can start talking all this, you know, nice Uno IDL stuff in C sharp. And frankly, it looks almost like any other language at this level, because most of it is just Uno, and then you can dynamically construct spreadsheets with beautiful things in them and pivot tables at the bottom, as you can probably see down here, you know, and all this, all this good stuff and do some nice dynamic, you know, uh, data mining and so on. But there's some really interesting new, new areas happening here. I, I talked a little bit about uh, the new XML format in Microsoft's Office 12. Um, there's some quite revolutionary things happening in Excel there. If you look at how Microsoft is investing money inside their Office division, which interests me, the majority of the investment happens not in Word, not in PowerPoint, but in Excel. This is where the real value is. That's where the really complicated, tangled numerical computation crunching happens. You know, Maybe you like kernel hacking and this sort of thing. That's child's play in comparison with the serious number grinding algorithms happening inside Cal. You know, forget the GUI piece. You know, There's some hardcore repeatable computer science in there. Either way, unfortunately, they're very good at it. Uh, they've got some uh, very good people on it. And just to kind of show off, uh, they're increasing all their, their limits. So previously, they had, I think, uh, 64,000 rows, and you know we now support 64,000 rows in Calc. We don't scale to it, but in theory, you can you know you can add that many rows if you want. Um, but Excel is now up to well, I don't know. I think that's a million rows, up from 64,000, and uh, we've gone from 256 columns to to uh, the, yeah 1,000, 16,000 16, columns. 256 to 16,000 is a big jump. And uh, 64K to a million is a big jump. And when you uh, multiply them by each other, you see that uh, actually really there's a huge, or, you know, three orders of magnitude difference here. And so if you consider, for example, where Excel would use an order n log n calculation, we would typically, you know, at least, at the best, probably use an order n squared if we can. You know, we'll try and find a slower algorithm, but order n squared versus n log n is pretty good. And when you make it, you know, a thousand times bigger n, you soon see the problem, right? OK? Uh, I, I assume you see the problem. And that's assuming that we did quite well and made it only n squared. Often, some of these things, you know, they, they like to do a, a list and then an n squared operation in it over, over it. And, you know, and it just it doesn't scale at all, basically. Um, and, you know, there's some people trying hard here, but the team is small. There's only four people in Sun working on Calc. OK, there's just more in Novell. There's some Intel people, joined, Google guys getting involved. Um, and uh, in fact, yeah, that's one of the interesting things about OpenOffice. I worked on Gnome for a long, long time. And uh, occasionally people come to me and say, look, we need to hire someone. You know, we need someone to fix this orbit bug you created. You know, who can you recommend? Um, but since I started working on OpenOffice, who are we going to hire? You know, I, I need to hire people. You know, who? Quick, quick, we need good people in the community you know, that we can hire, that know this stuff.
That's cool. That's cool. Excellent. Um, oh, wow, it's really loud too. I'll try not to lean on the desk again. Okay. Um, good. So, uh, where was I? Yeah. So anyway, that helps us sit around in the background. And the nice thing about that is that once you've started it, you can then load a document very much more quickly, or so you would think. Um, so we fixed that as well, because that was taking about a second just to launch the thing that told the other application, go load this document. Uh, you know. So we have this now tiny optimized stuff that Debian doesn't ship yet, but will, surely. Uh, and uh, that does this a lot quicker, sub-second, second document load. You know, you double click and it's there, effectively. If it's a small document, obviously document load time is something we can't control. And you turn that on here. There's the go swallow all my memory setting in tools options, you know, and uh, that's wonderful. Um, so the real reason that uh, this, I told you it got insanely technical at one point, okay? This is where it gets insanely technical. Um, hopefully you went to the Valgren talk earlier. I noticed the room was more packed then, so hopefully. And um, I need someone really bright here to tell me what the slow thing is on this drawing, right? Because I'm kind of lost, you know? Um, which is the thing that is here, and also here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here? This is incidentally a histogram of what, well, well it's more complicated than that. A drawing of what is taking the time during startup. Do look up X, yeah? Well, that's part of glibc, and glibc has this really mangled way of doing linking, part of which is specified in the alpha spec, hard to get around, um, but part of which is really just an unre unfortunate implementation. And uh, So there are some nice patches that I've been working on for some time that turn that into that, which is nice. Of course, it's still a histogram, so you, you don't really see the actual speed when it's still just as big as it was before, but we went from uh, you know 736 million simulated cycles down to 191, which is good news. Um, and we can shrink this, you know, further. Yeah, but it's sufficiently good news that um, uh, it makes the problem someone else's fault, and it's now a configuration manager that's taking all the time, which is the purple bits, as you can see. So anyway, we're working hard on this. Um, if you look at the real numbers that are actually accurate, instead of the cycle count, I, I just used to believe as if it were gospel. And then I spoke to Julian, um, wherever he is, and he told me he sort of laughed and fell about, because, you know, it's apparently only this really rough guess. But this is an accurate number. This is level two data cache misses. Now, you may know if you want to get some data, you know, it's almost always what you just wrote, right? You know, so you just get it from the level one cache, that's fine. Occasionally it's not there, you go to the level two cache, and it's there, it's just, you know, 100 times slower, or 10 times slower. Uh, but if you miss the level two cache, it's 200 times slower. So, you know, if you have a two gigahertz machine, you can quickly turn it into a, I don't know, you divide 2,000 by 200 and you get, or 10 megahertz, yeah? Right. So if you go around missing level two caches, you know, you, you can do some other stuff, but, uh, you know, it's like pressing that eight megahertz button on your old machine, you know, that doesn't work anymore, sadly. Um, but it, it's really like that. And so this is what we do a whole lot of, just due to some really, really dumb um, ordering of data and searching. And so we can then drastically reduce that. If you look at the numbers uh, here, uh, we have three, uh, four million level two cache misses uh, down to under a million. So. We're, we're improving the situation. Linking-wise, I think that takes us in real raw numbers uh, down to, unfortunately, this is way slower than it was, There's some nasty thing with X and suspending. We're a lot quicker. That's the punchline. Uh, and that can take over a second of startup, um, approaching two seconds from about four seconds of warm start. So it's nearly twice as fast with the right system. And if you can get the thing into glibc, it helps, which we can't, because of a man called Ulrich Drepper. So if you meet him, shake him by the hand and suggest, you know. But, uh... Anyway, oh, so we've also improved the, uh, the slide show in Impress, which is the bit that happens when you show slides. And you can have seen some of the bugs earlier in Julian's talk when the colors were, uh, and you couldn't see them. We fixed that in mind. Um, but uh, nice anti-aliasing, smooth lines, uh, accelerated on XGL. Uh, you know, there's some nice uh, examples here of, you know, before and after. The, the irony is, though, that um, there's some serious subdivision of this going on. Maybe you can see it. Uh, maybe you can see that this guy here is a, a line segment there, and maybe there's another one there, and, and so on and so on. Um, straight lines. If you don't improve the subdivision, you, you anti-alias it, and it all looks beautiful, except you can really clearly see these corners, you know, on, on where the subdivision is. So then you have to uh, go and fix all the subdivision as well, and we're still engaged in that. So another thing that people say, and particularly spreadsheet focused, you can see where I, uh, I came from, I guess. Um, VBA macros. Uh, the macros are in all enterprises. People go and write logic in them uh, that do funky things, and I'll show you uh, a demo of that in a second. But many of the macros are really, really simple. Actually, I'll show you the demo and maybe some of the code, because we, we paid for this code. And, uh, you know, I don't know. 
I want more from my programs, like flow control, you know, uh, and things like that, um, rather than just a sort of long linear line of statements. This is a uh, this is a shameless commercial plug, actually, but but I'll show you it anyway. Um, okay, enable the macros and, uh, and what they bring. This is a return on investment calculator for Novell Ensure. I don't know what Ensure is, but it's probably very good. And uh, so you, you click on this little widget here, and that runs a little VBA thing that goes next and next. And you can fill all your company info in, and you know you type uh, provisioning, meta directory, whatever that means, and then you, you click next, and you know and it, it flashes and flickers and sets some things and selects this. And this is probably quicker in Excel, incidentally, so that you don't notice it. Um, and you can then, you know, go on and say how many users you've got and the resulting calculations and the return on investment and how complicated your organization is and blah, blah. And at the end of it all, it tells you what a phenomenal sum of money you'll save if you buy Novell. So thank you. Yeah, um, um, but, but this is important, right? And, and, and the worst thing is, of course, that Gartner wrote it for us, Gartner Consulting, and, you know, so it has credibility and, you know, independent something or other. Uh, um, sorry, that, that was, uh, yeah, back to return on investment. And so, you know, it, it tells you all this thing in the end, you can print it out. This is brilliant. It's sort of a tiny application, right, written in, in Visual Basic. And you think, wow, it must be really hard to make this uh, work, right? Uh, well, not really, because when you start looking at the macros, uh, let me just go traversing down a uh, hundred menus. And You see, in terms of usability, this is really lame. It's expanded totally the wrong thing, right? Uh, I'm actually in this Gartner spreadsheet here and, uh, you know, just run this macro. But anyway, let me look at this. Most of the macros are just extremely simple, and um, most of the macros we've analyzed also still have a common comment saying, this was recorded by the Microsoft Excel macro recorder on blah, 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 right? Um, so, you know, without actually doing anything really very complicated, you can, you know, actually do a lot of very useful uh, stuff for people who have these problems. Uh, let me try and find some more juicy stuff. Yeah, go to next sheet, you know. Uh, not the most complicated uh, uh, function that, but uh, nevertheless very useful if you don't have a web browser and a remote thing and an exit, whatever, you know. So you get the idea. Good. So this is a very useful tool, and there are some more funky demos that are less obviously partisan. Um, let me find one of them here. Um, and you, you can achieve a lot. Let me encourage you to go and write VBA macros in, in OpenOffice, you know? And uh, if you come to my tutorial later, I'll show you quite how much better VBA is than Star Basic, and it's, there's some quite staggering differences, um, and some quite amusing weirdnesses as well. Incidentally, uh, you know, you have to explicitly enable the macro, and uh, otherwise you, you have real problems. So, you know, you can have uh, a random hypercycloid, you know, you can have your, uh, your favorites that, uh, you know, can be generated, and, you know, some, some simple charting, some simple VBA, and, a, you know, a pretty result comes out of it, and there's even a what is hypercycloid, which I never knew, so... Yeah, apparently you can make it with several spirograph circles and something else. So, you know, it's really bad. It's, it's not even 20% of the functionality is implemented, and yet we can do a lot of useful things with it. But of course, maybe your 20% is different to ours. So I'd encourage you, if you have access to VBA macros, send them to us. Uh, you know, run it and see what doesn't work, and we'll, uh, we'll try and make it better. So the cool things in OpenOffice 2.0x. So one of the cool things is, as I said earlier, that hopefully some of these features will come in the stable when they're ready and you know ready for prime time, and we'll have a, a more manageable code base. With 64-bit work, there's a whole load of ongoing work there, at Novell and Intel and so on, and we have binaries running. You know, you can run the Star Wars game in Calc. You know, this is one of the the, the first things. Actually, it's a shooter moment. It's like uh, I don't know, and. Uh, so, so it's getting there, right? But there's still lots of uh, testing and little bugs and, and help needed. Okay, they're going, gee, streamer support. Uh, media is a bit of an issue. They've ripped the whole media thing out and used the Java media framework. Um, and the reason, incidentally, Sun does is they get bad press for using Java. But if you're a small you know, team of only uh, 150 programmers or whatever, um, you can either, when you need to play a video, sit down and write an entirely new cross-platform abstract video player, right? You know, this is good. And then license all the codecs and blah, and blah, and blah. Or you can say, aha, our company already has a division that does this over there. Why don't we blame them when it doesn't work? You know, and, and use the tiny bit of code to use the Java media framework. And, you know, it's entirely someone else's problem, right? This is a very attractive thing. You can understand, right? You, there's no evil malice, let's lock out free software here. You know, there's just a, oh dear, I don't want to disappear down a huge black hole here, right? But unfortunately, we then have to go in, you know, filling the holes in um, afterwards. And so we're going to need GStreamer support uh, and some multimedia stuff there. Uh, not impossible to do. 
Uh, similarly, accessibility is done via Java Bridge, so it works on Linux and also uh, Windows. Unfortunately, it works on both rather slowly. Um, so there's a, there's a native bridge there that actually we're probably shipping now to improve accessibility and, uh, and make it much more responsive and uh, easy to debug and deploy on free systems. Microsoft Access Import, we have actually got an access backend so that you can talk to your access database and you can load your data out of it and put it in your spreadsheet and do a massive pivot table on it or whatever. Um, the problem is that the code is very good at what people test it for doing, which is essentially migrating away from access. Use MDB tools, brilliant. Dump your entire database, abandon access databases, and, and wander away. Um, unfortunately, the way our database thing works, you have to use their implementation of all the querying features and inner joins and blah, you know, and it, it's, it's a noddy, noddy database in that sense, but it's really good at getting data out. So we need to refactor this and turn it into a sort of importer. We'll pull your data in and allow you to shove it somewhere else and then still access it, along with your templates and forms and so on. So there's, there's some chunk of work going on there. Layout, the layout looks awful. Um, so there's more work happening here to use either something like Zool. Or, uh, I, I thought Zool was really cool. Um, for using this, you know, splitting the code out as well as the, the actual layout, very powerful into the dialogue, so the dialogue runs itself, you know, the dialogue is a program in its own right, uh, that you just say, go do whatever you do, and it throws up the dialogue, and, and you can edit it all. And it does seem good, but the problem is you have to rewrite most of the code in JavaScript, and, um, and then I talked to some Microsoft people who said, yeah, actually we tried that for like three versions ago, and it works really well for the search dialogue or something, but when you get to, you know, something complicated, it's a nightmare and lo, uh, we stopped doing it. Um, so, you know, but, but it's an interesting task, and improving the, the look of it is, uh, is worth doing. And Cairo rendering throughout the application, not just a slideshow. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff that needs doing there. So how am I doing for time? Oh, you haven't shown me any pictures yet. 17 minutes. So 2.0 is a massive improvement. It really is amazing. It's incredibly powerful, great feature depth. It's, it's an amazing sort of, um, I don't know, spearhead of free software on, you know, proprietary desktops out there. Lots of people are using it. Lots of people want to start using it. Uh, the sluggishness and the bloat that you perceive, particularly on Unix, but is not so much present there on Windows, um, is on the decrease. And we're, you know, beginning to win some of these battles, which is nice. So I, I'm optimistic that in two years' time I can come back and it'll start up like that, you know, faster than yes. And uh, OpenOffice is really a good strategic place to make your blow for freedom on that basis. There's lots of things to get involved with. There's a wiki to read, but you have to sign the JCA before you do that. And uh, my tutorial shortly afterwards, uh, I encourage you to come and you know, sign the JCA if you're interested uh, so you can contribute and get involved. So thank you for being very patient and kind. Thank you. I meant to mention that if there are questions, uh, as I hope there will be a few, we have these uh, Red Bygone Era with Zimian monkeys on them, which are Frisbees. And we also have some open Sousa shirts of gigantic proportions that we're trying to get rid of. So, on that basis, hopefully there will now be no questions. But uh, if you have a question, please uh, let rip. You've had one already, so let's wait. There's probably some, you know, you're all those programmer types that are kind of scared of speaking in public. You know, if you feel yourself wanting to question something, yeah, there's a man in the back. Hooray. I didn't hear any of that. Can you say it again? Any chance of integrated version control? Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, let me, uh, I might kill someone with this. So, you know. Oh, it didn't get there. If you could uh, help it on its way up there, that would be great. Um, yeah, so there are a whole load of things built into OpenOffice that make it really nice for reuse and kind of version control things. So there's compare changes, so you can get your two you know, documents side by side and see what happens. There's change tracking inside the document, so you can look at various different revisions and you change what and accept it and so on. Um, there's a lot of funky, funky work there. In terms of integrating in version control or content management systems, um, there's also some nice hooks, so you can uh, define your own stream. It's a virtual filing system layer of its own invention, of course. Um, and it tells you when documents opened, closed, renamed, resaved, and so on, all the hooks you need to integrate it with the content management system and, you know, add commit messages and annotations and blah, and blah, and blah. So, yes, it's easy enough to do. Um, we should do more work on that. Um, we're doing some work. In fact, there's a guy called Tall Lilkfist. There, yeah, hey. and, and he's doing some integration with uh, content management type systems using uh, ODMA. So, yeah. Any other questions? This man here. Are there special ways to install the 
Yeah, not a lot of RAM. Well, you saw the box, the, the chew your entire system memory box there. Yeah, you probably don't want to have that checked. Um, but, you know, for thin clients, this, the question is thin clients, how, how do you uh, have it working? The nice thing is that OpenOffice looks incredibly bloated and huge. And to be honest, there is a lot of code there. There's, uh, you know, 50 megabytes, 55 megabytes of dot text, just raw output. That's before you add the data and the symbols and all this other stuff. But all of that is, of course, well, the vast majority of that is shared, right? So in a thin client system, actually, startup and, you know, a memory usage should be substantially better than on a single client system because you share all of that huge chunk of code that is most of what makes OpenOffice a pain. Uh, to start up. So, yeah, it's good. I mean, the, the runtime allocated memory usage is about, you know, four meg for an empty document. Now, of course, you know, it can be improved, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, no real tips there on doing that. Um, I think it's pretty good. Uh, Sun actually running themselves on, of course, uh, Sunray. So, you know, they've done a chunk of work there themselves to, uh, to make it work, work nicely. Okay, this man here. Oh, the other joke. Yeah? Okay. First of all, um, I, you know, uh, I have problems when I uh, exchange uh, doc files with my, our managers. They write in Microsoft Office. Mm -hmm. We, the developers, we use OpenOffice. But uh, there's a lot of exchange of documents, of Microsoft documents, with the Open Office documents, and well, uh, it's, uh, we seem to have uh, find some troubles when there are uh, when we define predefined styles. Uh, for the formatting, right. and then um, when we exchange them back from Office and back to Open Office, then uh, they get a little bit next up. Can I be a bit mean, just briefly, too? Will you, will you care? That's good. I've just given you a frisbee. Um, okay, so this is a brilliant archetype of a problem. I'm not going to ask you this question yet. I'll ask you in a minute. But uh, I often go to conferences and talk to people, and they say, oh, there's this horrific bug. You know, when I do this import, this doesn't work. Oh, that's terrible. That's really awful. I'm glad you filed it. Filed it? <laughs> And they haven't actually bothered to report the problem. Now, I think, you know, that's a bit rude, actually, because, you know, if, you, if your compiler crashes in strange circumstances, hopefully you go through and you actually create a test case, you know, a small one, and send it to compiler people who then flame you endlessly and don't do anything. But at least you tried, right? You know, you know where the moral high ground is, okay? Um, but often, I think, through no fault of their own, users have become completely hardened to the fact that software doesn't work. And, you know, they try and mentally work around it. And, you know, I'm guilty of this, as is everyone else. And they don't bother filing good bugs. And that's really, really sad. So, did you file a bug? Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's probably not your mistake. If it doesn't do what you expect, then it's probably not your mistake. And it's good to get more bugs rather than fewer. I mean, yeah. No, 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 no I, I'm just being mean to you. But it, it is interesting. So, for example, I was at a party and some guy's using it. Oh, it crashes every time I do file send and loses all my data. Easy to fix, you know, it's just a null pointer somewhere, but, uh, you know, hadn't bothered to find it. So, I'll just come back to you. Um, anyone else? This man here had his hand up for a while. I, I, was, I was more or less question, but does mm -hmm. it ever depress you that you to always be me to the whole MS Office decade-old now paradigm? Do you sometimes think, oh, God, I wish I could just do something completely new, something, a whole new way of doing document processing and that? And it's very depressing that I have to kind of follow this quite tired disruption. Yeah, so, so the, I think the real question is I have a funky idea of how documents should be laid out. Why can't I do it? I, well, I, 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 I wrote a big document the other day and uh -huh. I, for the first time in a year and actually having to use all these things and I found it quite a depressing experience. Not, yeah. Not really there's got to be a better way. Yeah. Yeah, so there probably is a better way. Um, but it, the thing is that, from my perspective as Novell, obviously we want people's data to continue working and provide a solution for people. So that's, you know, that's pr primarily where we come from. So yes, we tend not to do, hey, let's completely invent the whole document processing paradigm thing. And if you look at the successful attempts to, hey, man, let's completely reinvent the world, uh, they are very few and far between, particularly in this area. However, there is some pretty funky innovation coming out. And if, again, you look at Apple's Keynote, for example, you know, some amazing presentation effects in there and, you know, just some really new stuff. But my feeling would always be then to incrementally build on what you have, you know? Don't start from nothing and reinvent the component system, the media system, this is, this, 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 you know? Build on what's there and improve it. Because a lot of, and if you've used OpenOffice, a lot of your pain is probably minor ergonomic stupidity rather than, you know, like, where's the styles? Why can't I find these styles? Why are they not docked on the right-hand side and easy to click? Why do I have to click a tiny icon to get the text style instead of the paragraph style? You know, there's so many simple things to fix, you know? 
to make it easier to use. And again, if you look at the Apple write, Writer product, I forget what it's called. You know, they do it right. They put the styles where you can get at them easily. Well, the ones that you use frequently, they put somewhere we can get at them. Um, so I think there's a lot we can do without radically reinventing it to improve the situation. And a lot of it's quite easily. But that was a brilliant question. OK, how, how long have we got? Uh, ten minutes. OK, this is, this is good. Go, go. So, so the question is, uh, you know, is it good enough just asking people if they want to enable macros? And the answer is probably not. And there's a tiny feature that needs writing here. And if you can look, scan along a string, you can write this feature. Um, but it turns out that when you load macros in, particularly this kind of macro, most of them are just non-macros. Someone just opened the macro recorder once, that kind of thing. You know, and it's stored some attribute, and there's actually nothing there. Um, and so, yeah, it would be great to filter out those false positives to, you know, so people don't become hardened to just enabling them. But the second thing is... Um, at least with Star Basic, uh, the primitives are not really there to allow you to do some of the things that are uh, possible in Microsoft's uh, Office Suite. And so hopefully we can do a better job of sandboxing them and containing them and, you know, and stopping some of the more grotesquely stupid things that can happen. Of course, you know, Python is quite a powerful language, and if you can run arbitrary Python stuff in your uh, you know, macro theory, you can do uh, you know, immense damage. Um, you know, so... The other thing is lockdown and management, and I'll talk a bit about that in my tutorial, but yeah, how can you stop people being able to run macros at all, maybe across your organization, or at least make it very difficult for them to shoot themselves in the foot. Um, yeah, so I don't know, it's not a very satisfying solution, but I think it's better than what Microsoft uh, uh, can offer. But the thing is, why not implementing such things such as Java implementation for the browsers, because mm -hmm. uh, you cannot write a file or something like that? Yeah, 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 sandbox, yeah, absolutely. Why not? Why not? Absolutely. I think partly we do that by, if you use Star Basic and Java, you're fine, broadly, because they, they don't allow you to do some of the more stupid things. Uh, but if you start using Python, you know, yeah, right. I mean, you know, it's, it's powerful for a reason, right? You know, people like to do uh, powerful things. And as you can see, you can do some very useful things with macros. If you turn them all off, you know, you rid the world of what is actually quite a nice, very rapid application, very simple to use development environment for simple numerical uh, things. So. Uh, you have a t-shirt. There you go. Gentleman in blue. I think if you're a baseball player, you have to also do this, don't you? Sort of frequently in a rather strange way. But uh, I, I'm not good at that. So I'll. Uh, are we planning to address the usability issues? Um, yeah. Yeah. I think probably the best way to do this is start a mailing list and get everyone to talk on it for weeks and, uh, you know, come up with some uh, ideas and mock-ups and then, you know, argue about them. And then, Are you going to help me fix usability? <laughs> no. Fair enough. Well, this is the problem with usability then. Um, but, you know, there's lots of people that want it and fewer people that actually create it and are prepared to do the fascist things necessary to get it. So, yes, I'd love to improve usability. Yes, there are lots of fairly simple things that we can do. Yes, we've done some of them, but, you know, there's plenty of scope for work there, sure. And, and I apologize for it. It makes free software look bad to a lot of people. So, yeah. So. Uh, in terms of importing from uh, various browsers, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible to import from the Chrome browser directly? Or do you need to import from the Chrome browser? So to what extent can we decode the binary Microsoft Office file format? Well, of course, we, we stop at Word, PowerPoint, Excel, right? We don't do plan, project planner and uh, Visio and, you know, some of the other uh, more interesting eclectic acquisitions that have been made and, you know, have quite different file formats of different structures and so on. Um, how much have we figured out of these? A huge amount, actually, amazingly. I mean, I think what you see in OpenOffice is probably the world's best outside Microsoft import-export you know, across the board like that. It's really extraordinary. Yeah, you can go to SoftMaker, and you can see the three features that we failed to implement that they've pulled out, and they have implemented. And, and look at the screenshots, and it looks terrible. It looks like we're failing all over the board. And, you know, it's convincing for me. You know, I look at it, and I think, what? You know, how come we're so bad and they're so good? But actually, then you download their free trial, 
version. And you're like, what? This is useless. It doesn't even do X, Y, Z, you know, and so on. So I think, sure, we, we do quite a good job, a really quite a good job, but um, it's a difficult problem. It's a really difficult problem. Particularly, it's made worse because of the lack of fonts. So on my system, I haven't had proprietary, unfortunately, licensed fonts from Ag Ag for Monotype. Uh, and that means when I load my documents, it lays out broadly, if I use Arial, uh, Times New Roman, and Courier New, it la lays out like it lays out on Windows. Uh, the problem is, of course, if you don't have those fonts, it lays out radically differently. And the whole structure of your document can often depend on proprietary fonts. So I'd encourage you, if you're a free software type person, to try and use fonts that are free. Okay, sounds silly, doesn't it? But, you know, say you write this long screed as MI5, you know, and it, you know, you've got two pages and you say, kill that bloke there, you know, in the text. And as you lay it out, you know, it points at this guy and then you load it in open office and then now it points at this guy, you know, who's actually the, the, your contact. Um, you know, it's, it's not so good, right? Um, and, you know, in terms of document archival and long-term storage and retrieval, it's a bit of a nightmare. And the worst thing is that this is a huge IPR issue um, that we can't really discuss and it's unsolvable, basically. There is no solution. You just have to use free fonts everywhere. And this is how Microsoft in interoperability works. They have Arial everywhere. They have you know, Times New Roman everywhere. It's the same font, the same metrics, and that's why it works. But we don't have that necessarily. And yeah, you can use some funky web download cache web font thing, but I don't understand to try and overcome that, but it's a serious problem. Um, so yeah, that's my hobby horse. Two more minutes, two more questions. This man here and this man here. You first. Why won't Ulrich Dripper fix my glibc problem? Well, he doesn't like to talk to me for reasons entirely unclear. He thinks there's this thing called prelink that solves the problem. Now, prelink does attempt to solve this problem, it's true. Um, but what prelink does is essentially fragments your disk so that uh, it may be faster to link, but you now have to do hundreds of seeks all over the place to load your data so it's actually potentially slower. And uh, it, it also uh, takes a huge amount of CPU time on every end user's machine. It needs rerunning every time you upgrade any library. And it doesn't work for DL opened libraries, which includes the vast majority of OpenOffice. Um, however, there are some minor theoretical efficiency wins to it. For example, if you're running multiple programs, uh, and they are pre-linked, and there are not very many fix-ups, then you can share some more pages between them. Of course, it's just meaningless for OpenOffice. And it's quite possible that, you know, uh, direct linking and some of these other hacks would have some minor slowdown on the incredibly elite, hyper-optimized you know, there's a lot of um, hyper-optimization of the code paths that do this currently rather silly algorithm that make it rather nasty to refactor, and there's just a lack of, a total lack of actually getting this fixed. I mean, and Ulrich just doesn't want to engage at all, seemingly. And, uh, what's that? What stops me from forking is it's a real pain to maintain a, a fork. I happen to maintain a semi-fork, small branch of OpenOffice, and it's a nightmare. Um, maintaining a branch of glibc, particularly in a very hyper-optimized elite piece of code, uh, and refactoring it as patches, especially when there are several features that you might want to merge separately, you know, optimized hash values, optimized direct linking, you know, it becomes depressing. So, okay, my secret strategy is this. Um, we'll create a, a nice set of patches that make linking much faster. We'll get them in SUSE, we'll get them in Gentoo, We're already doing some research on uh, doing this, and providing some valuable test data. Uh, and, you know, we'll try and encourage distributions to ship it, and in the end, reason will prevail. But, unfortunately, it's a rather distressing, and you can't do as good a job as you do if you, you get upstream, because you can't refactor as much, because patches suck. Okay, did I have one more question? It's a quick question, who was it? Yeah, quick. Why do we suck, yeah? <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's a very good question. Um, so the question is, why do we suck with PDF export in OpenOffice 2.0? And I have no idea. I'm sorry. There is, there is a new PDF export dialog, as you saw there, and you can check all sorts of options. Your question may be the flip side of, why does my image look so bad when I print it? Uh, you know, so we've raised the, you know, the resolution of the images. So I don't know. We can look into it. Thank you very much. Uh,